Hey everybody, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you about a new book from Faith Matters Publishing. It's called Restoration by Patrick Mason. Um, When we started the Faith Matters Publishing Project, one of our goals was to explore what restoration really means as the church moves into its third century, and that's exactly what Patrick does. If you're like me and you've ever wondered how restoring Israel can be relevant to you, you've got to read this book. Patrick shows how, as members of the church, it's our mission to truly lead out in bringing wholeness and healing to the marginalized and the vulnerable. This book absolutely lit a fire for me, and it has totally changed the way I view my own engagement with the church and with the world. I really can't recommend this book strongly enough. It's the kind of book you want everyone you know to be reading, too, so that you can talk about it. So you can pick up a copy for yourself or for your friends and family at Desert Book, um, Amazon, Audible, and Apple Books. Okay, that's it on the book for now, but we'll be sharing a lot more in the near future. Thanks as always, and here's the episode. Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. President Dallin H. Oaks delivered a landmark address at our church's last general conference. He spoke passionately about the U.S. Constitution and ended with an urgent admonition to end political tribalism and division. In this episode, Faith Matters co-founder Bill Turnbull reached out to his good friend Thomas Griffith, who is an expert in constitutional law, to explore not just President Oaks' address, but what lies behind it, the rapid erosion of goodwill and trust in American politics, including among Latter-day Saints. Griffith sees the possibility of a cataclysmic crisis in the not-too-distant future, and he believes that Latter-day Saints can and must play a critical role in healing today's divides. Thomas Griffith has served as chief counsel for both the U.S. Senate and for Brigham Young University, and was appointed to a judgeship by George W. Bush on the D.C. Court of Appeals, from which he recently retired. He now practices law in Washington, D.C., and teaches at Harvard Law School. Thanks so much, as always, for listening, and we hope that you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Bill Turnbull with Faith Matters, and I'm here with my good friend, Tom Griffith. So uh, Tom is coming to us from Virginia today, where you've lived most of your life, uh, with some notable uh, excursions out west at at various times. Um, Tom uh, is a lawyer by background. We brought him in because he's a constitutional scholar. He's been a, a federal judge on the D.C. Court of Appeals for a number of years. Before that was, was it immediately before that, you were you were the uh, le- the chief lawyer for the Senate. I was actually the general counsel at BYU immediately before that, and then before that was the chief lawyer for the Senate. Okay, okay. During the Clinton impeachment hearing, so that must have been that must have been. Fun. Yeah, so actually longer than that. I was for four years uh, the chief lawyer for the Senate. One of the things that happened while I was there, notable things, was the Clinton impeachment. So yeah. Well, we've had a lot of great conversations over the last few years, Tom, some really some some fun ones. And um, quite often they start with some missive that you send out, a, usually a text or an email and something interesting, start something to a group of our friends. And and the, the most recent one was uh, about the general conference addressed by Dallin Oaks. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later um, because he made some, I think, it, so some of us are rather startling plea to the church. Maybe strong plea is probably not strong enough word. What, would, what word would you use? Uh, I think he said we insist, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's, that's, kind of, that's the language of command. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, gonna, we're going to get to that probably by the end of this conversation. But um, he started out by talking about the Constitution. And um, the, uh, it, which was kind of an odd address. It started that way for me anyway. I thought we were past talking about sort of American exceptionalism to a worldwide church, but he semi-apologized before he started into it. And then it it became a little bit more evident why he chose that topic as he got toward the end of his talk, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was very careful to try and not make this just for Americans that he was trying to root it and ground it in uh, larger principles of uh, governance and uh, what democracy, what a republic is about, and our obligations as citizens uh, in the world. So I, th- I, th- I, th- I think he did a good job of <clears throat> making it universal. Yeah, I do too. Well, he let's start kind of where he started out. He, yeah. he started with the Constitution. Before he made his more specific point to the church, he started talking, he went back to the forming of the Constitution. I know, I know you have, you've written a lot on this topic, um, you teach, do you teach constitutional law now at, at Harvard? Is that what you teach? Or? Yeah, it's a form of it. Uh, it's, it's called the, it's about the role of uh, the federal judiciary uh, okay. under the constitution. Yeah. Okay. Well, give us a little background because you've written really eloquently on this subject. Um, we'll link to some of these maybe in show notes so people can 
and uh, yeah, excellent. yeah. So let's start with the idea that uh, this is a really perilous moment. Um, uh, you know, in our culture, uh, we we talk about the Constitution hanging by a thread, um, and and I don't know exactly what that looks like, uh, but I suspect it looks a lot like today, uh, at least in my lifetime. Uh, and and you know, I'm an old man now. I remember. Uh, the Cold War well. I, I remember Watergate well. I was living in the D.C. area and went to school with the sons and daughters of of the Watergate conspirators, right? that Was that an assault on the Constitution? You better believe it. That was a serious assault on the Constitution. And yet, in my, uh, in my view, uh, what we're experiencing right now uh, is far more serious a threat uh, on the Constitution than, than we've ever seen in, in, in my lifetime. I uh, people I admire and who write about this say it's the most serious threat since 1860. And as we recall, things didn't go well in 1860. And we're still living with the consequences of, 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 what, of what happened then. So, so I think it's, I think it's a, a, a perilous moment. Um, and um, I think we need to draw upon our best resources uh, to, to, to meet the moment. If, if, if we want the Constitution to continue to be uh, the, uh, the, the, the vital source of uh, democracy that it has been in our country um, and, 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 and around the world. Uh, and and, and the, the suggestion I have to offer um, uh, uh, is if, if we look at the way the Constitution was created, at least the draft of the Constitution was created in uh, the summer of 1787, there's some, I think there's some really surprising and profound uh, insights that, uh, that, 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 that apply. Um, and I'm relying largely on the scholarship of a young man named Derek Webb, who was a student of Michael McConnell's at Stanford at the, Constitu at the set, uh, at McConnell's uh, Constitutional Studies Center there. And, uh, and I got to know this young man, Derek Webb, when I, when I used to teach at, at Stanford. And uh, he wrote an article almost a decade ago now, with a, uh, at least for lawyers, it's a very catchy title. It's called the original meaning of civility, colon, democratic deliberation in the Philadelphia Convention. Uh, and I won't, uh, maybe you can put, you know, I've, I've written about this, uh, and maybe you can, yeah. I, I, won't, I won't bore people with the details. But here's the gist of it. Here's the gist of it. Uh, he looks at small group dynamics and sees how they played out in uh, the summer of 1787 and created what Washington described as the spirit of amity and mutual deference, which the peculiarity of our political circumstances rendered indispensable. I mean, Washington recognized, everyone there recognized something really remarkable happened because the, the whole convention was about to crater uh, in July, six, seven weeks later it succeeds. And Washington says the reason it succeeded was the spirit of amity and mutual deference, which was necessary at that moment. So my my, my point is, I, I think we're I, I think the spirit of amity and mutual deference is necessary. At so this what happened moment. then? What did it What did it look like yeah. in at the constitutional convention? Yeah, according to Webb, um, uh, it's very interesting. He he, he said he, he looks at the rules of the convention, um, and they were set up um, so that you had you, you had to attend if you were in Philadelphia. You had to attend uh, if someone had the floor. Uh, you had to listen to them. The rules forbade you from uh, talking to someone else, uh, from reading anything else, or from working while someone was was talking. I mean, the value there is the, the presumption there is you're going to listen to people. Right? You're going to listen to people. The, the other rules, um, uh, they, they, it was in secret, right? Uh, no official record was taken of votes, and Webb suggests that what's going on with those rules is um, a presumption that that you will actually change your mind. You know, that you're, you're going to be listening to, to people and they're going to persuade you to change your mind. So in other words, there actually be absolutely nothing wrong with a delegate in Philadelphia in 1787 saying, yeah, I voted for that before I voted against that. You know, yeah. now when someone says that, you know, we just, we, we pillory them like, ah, oh, what a hypocrite. In the summer of 1787, that wasn't a hip, that was a hypocrisy. That was called statesmanship changing your mind based on persuasion. But the real, the real uh, uh, I think the fun part of it, but it's a it's significant part is uh, Webb talks about the sociality that existed amongst the delegates. They worked every day, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, 10 to four in convention. But then they would 
they would go to taverns and have dinner and have tea and spend time with each other. And, and this, is, this is just such a cool thing. After a couple of weeks of being in Philadelphia doing that, they formed dinner groups, right? They had dinner groups. And, um, and it wasn't a dinner groups chosen by region or by ideology. They were just thrown together. And they got, as George Mason wrote to his son about this and in effect said, man, I'm getting, to, I'm getting to know people that I never knew before. And you know what I'm finding out? They're not so bad. They're not so bad. That all leads up to um, what I think is the key insight um, from web scholarship and, 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 and looking at the way small group dynamics worked in Philadelphia that summer. And that is when things were about to fall apart, um, uh, the, the, we all know from high school history and civics what happened. They came up with the grand compromise, right? You create a house and a Senate and everyone's happy uh, with, with, with that. Um, but what Webb suggests is there's something more fundamental that took place before they agreed to the grand compromise. And it's this, and, th and this is the money point, I think. This is the real takeaway, is that the delegates decided that they would compromise for the sake of union before they knew the terms of the compromise. That's now that's risky. Almost impossible to imagine today, but they say it, that. That is, <laughs> that is really risky, but they did it for the sake of union. Okay, so here's my, here's the lesson I try and extrapolate from that. And I, I think this works. And I, I, I think it's important for us. If you wanna support and defend the constitution, and we all say we do, uh, military uh, personnel take an oath to support and defend the constitution, civil officers take an oath to support and defend the constitution, and, and everyone else wants to, right? We all talk about that. Well, if you wanna support and defend the constitution, I believe you need to be an agent of reconciliation. You, you need to get into that spirit that created the constitution in, in, in the first place you've got to be willing to, we've got to be willing to say, for the sake of union, uh, I'm going to pull some punches. I I'm going to compromise. Uh, I'm not going to compromise everything. I mean, there's some core things that, that I'm not going to give up, uh, but those core things are probably a lot smaller than we might think. And the idea here is uh, I retreat, you know, I, I hold on to my core things. I give up a lot of other things so that you can hold on to your core things. And I do that willingly because I want to live with you. I want to be in community with you. It's that's a long big. way. That's hard work. It's a long way we're from where we are today. But, yeah. but I, I think, I, I believe if you want to support and defend the constitution, that's what you do. If you are an agent of division, okay, if you're stoking up fire, you know, the passion and anger to divide people, you are undermining the Constitution. You're working against it. So are you um, pessimistic, optimistic? Where, are we going to be successful at doing anything like what you're talking about here? Let's talk about Jonathan Haidt for a minute. Yeah, are, yeah. Both great, I think we both really uh, value his insights on this. What? Yeah, and, and the great thing about Haidt, I mean, he's the author of The Righteous Mind that, that helps us understand why people think so differently about things. And it's not that they're bad people. It, it, it's it's just that they see the world differently, right? If any book, if any book should be uh, required reading for voters, I think that that might be. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. Before, yeah, uh, read the Righteous Mind. Uh, well, so so he's not a he's not a very political guy. He's not a, certainly not a partisan guy. Uh, I, I think he identifies when he's pressed on it uh, that he you know he identifies as a progressive sort of thing. So he's sort of center left guy, but he's not he's not a partisan. And that's why it struck me that a couple of years ago, I read a quote that he gave. He was, I think he was doing a, a book tour for one of his books. And he said, this is, a, this is a direct quote, but it's pretty close. He said, in the next 20 to 30 years, he predicted there would be a cataclysmic failure of American democracy. Why? He said, because we just don't know what happens when you drain all trust out of the system. Um, you know, I, we're all used to hearing cataclysmic predictions for end times and things like that. And, you know, the, the standard joke, the New Yorker cartoon of the guy standing on the street corner saying the end is near. And in our own tradition, we've had 
you know, people that have made dire predictions about the future. And I got to tell you, I've never paid much attention to them. I'm sorry. I just, I'm not into the, the dire prediction, uh, end of the world uh, 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 scenario. I just don't think much good can, can come of it. And so when someone like Jonathan Haidt, who isn't in the apocalyptic space, says something like that, that, that captures my attention. I, and I think he's right. And, 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 and the, the, the problem is the lack of trust. You drain trust from the system. And we're living through that moment right now, right yeah. now. And, it, and it's reflected in, well, something as obvious as how people, how people perceive the results of the last election. Yeah, this is the big one right now. Um, when 75% of Republicans don't believe the last election was fair and square, um, that's a serious problem. Well, they, think it, they think it was stolen. It was stolen, yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's a serious problem for our you democracy. That talk. is draining all trust from the system. Yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, the problem is that's not true. Is, is demonstrably not true. It's a good example of how misinformation gets into public discourse. Um, you can, you, you tell something, you, you know, now we know that agree or, or not agree with, uh, support or not support President Trump as president. We have to remember that he began telling that, that lie before he got elected the first time that the election was going to be stolen. And then of course he found out it wasn't stolen, but he know he knew and this time he started telling that story well before the election. And uh, you tell a story long enough, loud enough, and your supporters are going to want to tend to believe it. But the truth is the election wasn't close, and, um, and, but we have a significant number of people who think it was. Now, I, was con I have to tell you, I was concerned on election night and after election night, I was seeing things coming and like, is that, is that shenanigans? And then I, I cared enough to look at what actually happened and as the days unfolded explanations for what happened and it was just people making stuff up um basically and uh yeah, so I, I i agree with you that, that, that that's true that's not to say there aren't uh issues that are worth exploring yeah. and, and 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 the good news is is there are a lot of uh, outfits out there that are doing that right now yeah. um and and uh, and trying to do it in a nonpartisan way that to get to get you know to study the facts, present them in a in a in a, in a, in a fair way, um, uh, and and, uh, and, and, and and present them in a way that gives respect to people who have been told otherwise. Uh, you know, Senator Mitch McConnell spoke of this on the on, on, the, on the floor of the Senate when he was talking about uh, the the insurrection in the Capitol. He said, uh, you know, these people believed things that they were being told by people. Uh, those things happen to not be true, um, uh, but we need to do a job. We need to do a better job of getting the story out there and not doing it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a partisan way. Doing it in a way that, that that treats our fellow citizens with respect um, and and acknowledges that there no there are problems in our election system. We can do better, but the, but um, there's the, the evidence that, that that somehow the outcome of the election was stolen here. That, that's not it. Go to the nationally elected, uh, go to Senator Lee, go to Senator Romney, ask them, what do they think? That neither of them thinks it was stolen. Nobody, I want to be careful here. I mean, there, there, uh, there, there are things to look at and, and to I'm improve sure. in the well, election. Absolutely. Yeah. You always want, you want elections to be perfect. We've yeah. probably never had one. But nobody of any in, in, in any position of responsibility believes that the election was stolen, re Republican or Democrat, that I know. I, I think that's true. Uh, so just, I, I, but the fact that. remains, we believe that so many people believe it was stolen. So what, why, how have we arrived at this position? What is it that's causing this? What's Boy, that's mean? way beyond, that's way beyond that's my pay grade. Um, let's, talk about, let's talk about um, media, social media, cable sure. news media. I mean, they're, so they're the easy targets, right? And and uh, the fair ones. I, um, I'm I'm a big fan of Arthur Brooks, and 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 when he describes uh, when he talks about cable news, uh, he refers to it as the outrage industrial complex. Uh, and it's a clever phrase, but but he writes, he drills down on that, and he points out that um, 
uh, it's all economics driven, right? Um, the, the, the cable news, uh, cable news uh, uh, outlets um, have discovered that, that uh, the way ad revenues are driven is by uh, getting people uh, outraged, right? Uh, yeah. and, and they have figured this out and they do it wonderfully. I mean, um, when, when I speak at, uh, uh, at law schools and when I teach my class, I, I, I make the point, there is not breaking news every 10 minutes. <laughs> There's just not, except on cable news, right? And, and, and so you go, you watch, you, you, know, you, you, you get your passions all inflamed by the latest outrage from the left or the right. And, and, it, and, it, it, and it, it just generates um, a, a willingness um, uh, to be used, to be played. I mean, I, 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 I tell my students this, if, 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 you're get, if your primary source of information these days is from cable news or social media, now you need to understand you're being played, okay? You're being played. Um, because the bad news people. here is how to get how do you get out of that, right? And and, and here's this is really bad news. It's hard work. It's hard work. Well, um, some, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Challenge you there. It's not too hard to work to go turn off CNN or Fox News or because I've, I I go into homes and particularly maybe around here that latter channel is playing in homes almost twenty four seven. And yeah, no, they, turn it off. They are turn it off. Expert. Yeah, so turn it off. It's, it's sure. not, you're getting all you're doing is getting your biases confirmed. You're getting your outrage triggered. Triggered. Uh, they they're experts at keeping the amygdala and the brain fired up, uh, yeah. and so it, it needs constantly to be fed. Yeah. So uh, you know, and we that's that's the environment in which a lot of people live. For younger people and and more and more uh, people our age, it's social media. And social media, they've figured out how to do exactly the same thing. They find out what you believe and they're gonna feed you sources that confirm that belief. That, that, that wonderful movie that Netflix had, The Social Dilemma, if you, re, if you watch that and don't understand that if you're spending a significant amount of time on social media, you are getting played. If you don't understand it by the end of that movie, you haven't seen the movie. So, you know, it is, they're expert at it and it's driving, uh, that's one of the big reasons that's creating tribes so you get these echo chambers, and almost everyone I know lives in an echo chamber. No, that's what, no, you, it, it, part of it is not hard work. Yeah, turn off cable, just turn off. Um, but here's the hard work. Um, it's a complicated political ecosystem that we live in. There are lots of issues, and these are important issues. And to stay informed as a citizen actually is hard work uh, because you've got to read lots of different sources. You know, I, I, I recommend, my, recommend my students that they, they read um, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal every day, right? Uh, so that you get, you, you, you get the same news story from you know, perhaps a different slant, that they read the Atlantic and the National Review, right? Um, uh, yeah, get outside right. your, your echo chamber. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I, th I think being able to open your mind and heart to other points of view is absolutely critical right now. Yeah. And that's what we're being asked to do by our leaders uh, on a more regular basis and particularly in this last general conference. Um, there's also in our, our, in our church a bit of a generation gap, it seems. So we're divided. We come to church. Tell, first of all, tell me what it is particularly about the Latter-day Saint Church that holds promise for creating more amity, for creating more openness. Yeah. No, I think we have great resources uh, to do this. I mean, Richard Bushman, uh, I've heard him say that he thinks perhaps our greatest gift to the world. Now, just pause for a second. Fill in the blank. Go to a gospel doctrine class and say, okay, what is our greatest gift to the world? And, and there'll be lots of great answers. I heard Richard Bushman on one occasion say, our greatest gift to the world could be that we know how to build community. That we're, we're really good at that. We're, we're the, we don't have much iconography in the church, right? But one, we, one thing we do, it's the beehive, right? We're the people of the beehive. And uh, I think that's a powerful symbol of our success at building a community. Gene England, 
you know, describe the workings of a Latter-day Saint ward uh, as, as, as creating one of the most radical engines for social transformation on the planet. And, and, and Gene said it, it came from two factors which working in tandem produced something uh, uh, transformational. The first is we're, we're parochial in, in the sense of uh, uh, you, you live here, you go to church in this ward, you don't get to choose, right? So I don't get to, you know, I, I don't get to choose Bill Turnbull's ward so that we can, uh, you know, feed on each other and, 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 and exercise confirmation bias between us. No, I, I have to go to the Catoctin ward. Uh, and you know what? I may not like any of the people there. I may not, these may not be people I would choose to socialize with or go to a movie with or have lunch with, but under the Lord's system, I have to, I'm going to church with them, right? Okay, that's the first point, the, the parochial nature of, 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 of the ward organization. Then you combine that with the lay ministry. Everyone's got a piece of the action, right? The, the sweat equity that comes from everyone having callings. And now I'm not just sitting on the pew next to this person, but I'm going to be working with them in the primary or the mutual or some other project. And, and, and so for that to succeed, I, I've got to learn to like that person, right? And, and of course, we've all, hopefully we've all had that experience that over time, we, we find out that this person who has such different views than we do about music and politics and these sorts of things, um, that we begin to discover that the Lord loves that person every bit as much as us, that, that he died and lives for them every bit as much as us. And that's the beginning of wisdom. So we know how to do this. We do this in our wards all the time. Yeah, we're at a point uh, now, though, where it has become challenging to come together and forget, like leave our echo chambers and come together. It's a challenge to do that, right? There will be, um, but that's what we're be being challenged to do. And particularly Elder Oaks brought this yeah. to us very strongly uh, in this last, do you want me to read? This is- Yeah, this that'd is, be great. This is, from Tom's, great. this is from Tom's text. I got this text right after uh, uh, General Conference, and I think it was sent to six or eight of our friends too. Um, Tom said, the money quotes from Ballon Oaks Easter Sunday talk. Now listen carefully to, the, to this. On con these are excerpts from the talk. On contested issues, we should seek to moderate and unify. There are many political issues and no party, platform, or individual candidate can satisfy all personal preferences. Each citizen must therefore decide which issues are most important to him or her at any particular time. Then the members should seek inspiration on how to exercise their influence according to their individual priorities. This process will not be easy. It may require changing party support or candidate choices, even from election to election. Well, that, you know, that's quite a statement right there. It goes on, but- um, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this, I don't, believe, I don't believe I've heard a, a general authority take quite such a strong stand, but then listen to what he says next. Such independent actions will sometimes require voters to support candidates or political parties or platforms whose other positions they cannot approve. You can imagine what some of those might be. Gosh, I can't be that party because they believe in blank. Now he's challenging that. That's one reason we, we encourage our members to refrain from judging one another in political matters. We should never assert that a faithful Latter-day Saint cannot belong to a particular party or vote for a particular candidate. We teach correct principles and leave our members to choose how to prioritize and apply those principles on the issues presented from time to time. And listen to, the, listen to what he says here. We also insist, he said insist, and we ask our local leaders to insist that political choices and affiliations not be the subject of teachings or advocacy in any of our church meetings. And I remember after that, talk and he, he sat down Elder Rasband got up to give his talk next and he made a point to turn to Elder Oaks and said thank you Elder Oaks for that very important message so this is something that the 12 have have uh, been really concerned about what is the issue that they're concerned about well I, I certainly don't want to speak for them but it, it, as I as I hear them uh, in general conference and and, and elsewhere um, I think the issue is unity in the church. Um, uh, that that too many of us have allowed our dearly held political views, carefully considered political views, um, 
to become more important than our church membership. Uh, yeah. I, so I, so I, I, all my adult life, I was a conservative Republican, right? Until I became a judge and then I, not partisan at all. But, um, and I had, you know, I had strongly held views and I was active in Republican party politics. And, uh, but I never, I never thought that my views were the result of some insights into the nature of the gospel that compelled me to be a Republican. That, that, that just, I just thought that, I think that thinking is so uh, short-sighted and, uh, and it's not very humble, right? Uh, um, I, I've, I've always thought, I've had my political views, I may be wrong about them. I may be dead, I don't think I am, but I may be dead wrong about them. One of my favorite quotes is from the Puritan revolutionary Oliver Cromwell, who told his men, I beseech, or told his people, I beseech ye in the bowels of Christ, think that ye might be mistaken, right? <laughs> and so, I, you know, I've had my... Yeah, the problem is... I might be wrong. We get very wrapped up. We get very wrapped up in in narratives that these days they are so, it's so easy to get them enforced because we can always find that little corner, that little echo chamber, where these things get enforced. And sometimes crazy things come out of that. So beliefs that are quite extraordinary. And I think that that may be one of the reasons that recently the this is also kind of extraordinary that the the church changed made a change to its handbook. Yeah, yeah. It basically said. Something to the line, something along the lines are if if you um, if you're listening to people who promote uh, fear, contention, conspiracy theories, uh, back away from those sources. Yeah, that shouldn't be where you're getting. So if you're feeling those things when you're when you are um, engaging in your favorite media and you're kind of going down that rabbit hole. Taken about face. That's that. If you're feeling those kinds of feelings, you know, in these conspiracy theories, it's really quite remarkable how evil we can we can believe our fellow our fellow human beings are, and and, and it's that seems to me to be the problem with with the direction we're going. It's not that not just that we disagree. We believe the other people, the other side is evil, and we yeah, have right, create right. narratives around that. Yeah. No, the, the, you know, the, the, to paraphrase Michael Gerson, the Constitution anticipates vigorous disagreement, but but what it cannot withstand is the citizenry that holds each other in contempt. I think that's that's the point. D disagree. All we're supposed to be arguing and disagreeing about marginal tax rates, national security, how to how to expand equality, how to preserve liberty. I mean, these are big issues, right? We're supposed to be disagreeing about it. We cross the line, however, when we think that the person we're di disagreeing with is evil because of their views. But what do we hold them in contempt? You know, that that's Lincoln's first inaugural, you know? Um, you know, we, we cannot be enemies. We must be friends. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. And, 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 and you're right. So many of these conspiracy theories, they shred the bonds of affection. You don't want to be part of, of, of people who disagree with you. That's a that's a pretty good sign that uh, that whatever is motivating us isn't a good thing. Um, okay, so so let's let's try to maybe conclude this if we can sure. on, a, on a positive note. Okay, yeah, let's be positive. You made the point. Well, you don't have to because you. May, I think I think maybe one of your conclusions is yes, the Constitution is hanging by a thread. That Jonathan Haidt may be right. That in the next two or three decades, we may uh, not be able to keep this thing together. It is a republic, sir, if you can keep it, right? Or right, exactly. exactly. Now, yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna be cautious about the hanging by a thread thing. I've, I've always been worried about that in our culture. What, is, what does that mean? So, but, but if you were to ask me, what, is it, uh, what does it mean? <laughs> this isn't a conclusion, this is my opinion, maybe wrong. No, this is pretty scary. It's pretty scary right now. And I, and I say that, uh, with some experience and some some knowledge um, about the Constitution, its history, and 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 how it works. So yeah, I, I, it's a scary moment. Is it hanging by a thread? I I don't know exactly what that means, but yeah. uh, well, it's it's when things become very tenuous. Can the Republic yeah. help the other? There there is that um, phrase emerges from our history. Um, right. 
apparently Joseph actually did say something like that probably on more than one occasion. But um, uh, I think what, what we've been asked to do now is, is this not correct? We've been asked to engage the way Latter-day Saints have been taught to engage, the way we're structured to engage, the genius of the ward, which brings us together um, and makes us, helps us. To, we can model something important for the, for the earth, but beyond that, um, Elder Oaks is calling us to civic engagement and um, peacemaking and uh, getting beyond, not, not buying into uh, what seems to be dragging this nation toward division. And boy, the, the messages from conference were so on point and so um, resonent to that. Yeah, so I think we have a great, you know, once again, Richard Bushman talks about radiant Mormonism right now. He used that phrase before we're trying not to use Mormonism, but radiate, radiant Latter-day Saintism, right? That, that, that Latter-day Saints uh, in the diaspora and, and in Utah as well um, have a, have done really well at, at, at becoming influential citizens in positive ways. And, and I, think, I think this moment presents us with a unique opportunity uh, be, because of our doctrine, because of our experience, uh, that we really can be the people who are the builders of bridges. Um, uh, but we, we're not gonna be doing that if we're just stand, sticking in our echo chamber, listening to, People who are beating up on uh, on the left or the right that that can't you know I came of age when Spencer W. Kimball was president of the church and for the youth he he talked about a style of our own in dressing grooming standards well I I I'd, I'd like to see a Latter Day Saint style of our own in politics why can't we be known as the people who oh you're the builder of bridges right you're the we as David Brooks said you're the weavers right you're the people who are working um, across ideological divides to, to, to unify our country. Oh, that's what Latter-day Saints are about. Um, so, so can I end on a, a, a high spiritual note, I think? Absolutely, yeah. So um, we all know John 17 from our missionary days, right? We use that when the Savior uh, is, is praying to Heavenly Father uh, on the eve of his trial, on the eve of his betrayal, and, and, and we do a good job pointing out, look, the nature of the Godhead, you know, the, the, the Father and the Son are separate and distinct. We know that passage, we, we, we use it, we use it well. It was only recently that listening to a lecture um, by N.T. Wright that, that it, 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 it struck me that there's something else in that passage that's really important, that when, that when the Savior is praying to Heavenly Father, he's praying for the church that they may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us. And once again, I've always used that to talk about, you know, the nature of the Godhead. Uh, Wright points out um, that the Lord goes on to say that the world might believe that thou hast sent me. In other words, the purpose of that prayer was to pray that the church would be unified because the primary witness that we offer to the world of the divinity of Christ is unity in the church. And so my plea to me, to all, look, um, President Oaks was speaking to me. Uh, he was calling me to repentance. Uh, I've been a single party voter all my adult life, right? And, and he was saying, hey, Griffith, you need to think that through a little bit more carefully, right? So there's a, there's a lot of work that I've got to do with, with, with his talk. Um, yeah, I, and, I, I grew up a Republican like you. I was chairman of the Young, young Republicans, um, but I, I, I have switched uh, back and forth between not, not so much party affiliation, but certainly um, voting. So, so I, I actually grew up a Democrat and became a Republican when I learned, when I learned to read, Bill. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke to everyone out there. But, but the, 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 point, the point is, um, from John 17, and I'll just finish with this, is that um, by covenant my primary obligation is to help the church be unified so that we can bear witness of Christ in all the world. That's what we're primarily about. And to the extent that my political views get in the way of that happening, abandon those views or shut up about them or get off social media. Because if you're causing division in the church over your political views, or in the community. 
in the community, uh, you're undermining your witness of Christ. So here we go. Two things I've said. Okay, if if you're if you're an agent of division, you're undermining the Constitution. If you're an agent of division, you're undermining the church's witness of Christ. So maybe that's not a positive note to end on, but I think I, I but but yeah. I think I think those are important messages. I think that message is clear from Elder Oaks. So yeah, I think I, I keep, think he hit a 500 foot home run on that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for exploring that with us, Tom. As always, sure. thank you. Good friend and just a just a lot of fun to talk to. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation. And a big thanks also to Thomas Griffith for coming on. If Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read and appreciate every review, and it helps so much to get the word out about Faith Matters. Thanks so much again for listening. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.